Welcome to The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner. As usual, it's good to have you with us. Before we start our program today, I want to tell you to get ready. We're relaunching The Mark Steiner Show at The Real News on November the 10th. Conversations like this, along with new stories, will be coming your way all the time. And today, we're going to explore what the left should be doing in this presidential election. Most of us understand that both parties are corporately controlled in so many ways. And then from 1976 to 2004, I worked or voted for third party candidates in presidential elections. Now we're faced with a resurgent, powerful, well-organized, blatantly racist right wing and a man in the White House who was a sociopathic narcissist, manipulated by those right wing forces. The perception is that the left is not as well organized, but the right is more organized, more exacting, more sure of what they want and how to get there. Obama's tilt toward the corporate centrist intertwined with the depth of racism in our country gave those well-organized Republicans the U.S. Senate. They refused to confirm former President Barack Obama's Supreme Court nominee, Merrick Garland. And it was really close to the election when that happened in 2016, even though the nomination was done in March. Now, meanwhile, Trump's nominee, Amy Coney Barrett, will likely be confirmed just a week before this 2020 election. This is one example of where Democrats seem to have lost their ability to fight, to organize the fight. So what should the Democrats do to turn that table around? More importantly, what should the left be doing and the growing progressive movement? How should they respond? I mean, 23 million people have hit the streets in protest against racism and police brutality. So here we are today, talking about a very clear perspective on what the left should do in this coming election that's less than two weeks away. We're joined by Norman Solomon, author and co-founder of RootsAction.org, frequent guest here on The Real News. And Norman, welcome back. Good to have you with us. Thanks, Mark. So let me just begin with the, uh, that recent presidential debate that we just saw. Um, and I thought I heard Biden apologize for mass incarceration. I thought I also heard him say he was going to put a public option in the medical plan, in the health care plan. So tell me what you thought. I mean, what's your analysis of what happened in that debate? I mean, what, what did we learn or not learn uh, what we saw? Well, on those two points, um, in recent weeks, uh, belatedly, Biden has apologized for his vote on the horrific 1994 crime bill that did help pave the way for mass incarceration. He was key to passage. And he, uh, in a, a little bit more muted way, apologized uh, during this last debate in the presidential season. Also, you know, an embrace of the public option. I mean, it's a it's a step in a good direction, but we know that we need Medicare for all. I would say that overall, you know, Biden is sounding uh, more grounded in some sort of decent policies, but we know he has a, a record on war and corporate power that uh, the left uh, finds reprehensible. When you look at the two candidates on the screen and in the race, I think there should be no question that the left has a responsibility to uh, actively oppose the candidate who represents constituencies of white supremacy, of arrogance, of contempt for uh, public health, uh, xenophobia, uh, misogyny, and we could go on and on. We've been uh, acquainted to uh, a horrific degree with these realities for almost four years now. The left has a historic responsibility to fight against neo-fascism. And I think there's been, I would say, Mark, a sort of a, a growing sophistication and depth among the left, broad sectors of the left in the US uh, in the recent months and years, where we're breaking down this artificial barrier between in the streets activism and electoral work. We need both. We need a capacity to fight for state power, both within the election process and through overall agitation and organizing in the society. So let me push a little bit on this. I mean, when you talk to some people on the left um, and people, colleagues here at The Real News, um, people I know in groups I've worked with, people in my own family, um, and, and you talk about this, there's a, real, there's a real disconnect sometimes. I mean, you know, to figure out what the difference is between settling for Biden and strategically voting for Biden, right? Or not doing it at all. Uh, people are, who are disenfranchised in this country can argue that the U.S. has never been a democracy. Uh, their vote doesn't change the circumstances they live in or, or other oppressed groups. Um, they've, they've never had a piece of the pie. They're not even getting the crumbs in a liberal white agenda. Uh, and it's a sham democracy. So we should, and it's run by the corporate power and it's a center-right government. So why should we 
throw our, our arms around Biden and Kamala Harris to see them win when there's no guarantee they're going to do anything for the rest of the country. And it's the same old systemic racism we're facing. So how, yeah. how do you respond to that? Yeah, we shouldn't throw our arms around Biden. We should see him as a mechanism to fight against the white supremacy and the extreme right-wing forces that now have control over the executive branch and increasingly over the judicial branch, as well as much of the Congress. I mean, it is really something that doesn't pass the grim laugh test uh, when we do hear a minority, but uh, sometimes loud voices on the left saying there's no difference between the two parties. In 2020, that is preposterous. It's a form of gaslighting. All you need to do is look at the appointees on the Supreme Court. Uh, now we have a third one coming in. These are extreme right-wingers, and to conflate them with Sotomayor or Ruth Bader Ginsburg, it's just um, ideology run amok. And uh, the woman's right to choose and the woman's reproductive rights across this country uh, are obviously grievously threatened. Uh, the elements of democracy we have in terms of voting rights have been struck down by this increasingly right-wing Republican uh, nominated court. So there's a sort of a magical thinking sometimes in you know, some sectors of the left, I think it's fair to say that, well, if we just uh, can organize effectively and ignore elections uh, or keep ourselves uh, willing to not sully ourselves with uh, voting for, yes, the lesser of two evils, that somehow that's where it's at. And maybe we'll have more subscribers to our magazine and get more people or demonstrations. That's not the index of the strength of a movement when the right wing is gaining more and more state power. And in many ways, uh, we're at a tipping point in terms of that power becoming, in, in some respects, irreversible, let alone the climate where we have a, uh, a leading climate denier in the White House. So it's time, it's past time to see elections as something that, uh, uh, as an element of movement work. And I've been working through rootsaction.org to promote the Vote Trump Out campaign. And people can see Noam Chomsky's, I think, really insightful two minute video at votetrumpout.org, where he says it doesn't matter how you feel about Joe Biden. We have a threat here of an extreme right wing. Uh, we have to recognize what's at stake. And I, I would say, Mark, just sometimes there's a sort of an almost self-therapeutic fixation that occasionally people on the left can fall into. I'm not gonna, uh, I will feel better if I vote a certain way or don't or advocate for a certain vote in a certain way. It's not about how you feel. This is not a therapy session. Uh, there are the rights of millions and millions of people at stake. And I, I would just sum up uh, by saying that uh, if we understand elections as simply a tool rather than the be all and end all or something to totally ignore, then it's part of the toolbox. And that's how we get stuff done and that's how we make it part of the movement building. And uh, I would add in that sense that sometimes there's tremendous amounts of energy and resources wasted, for instance, in this presidential race to try to convince people in Maryland or New York or California who they should vote for. In the presidential race, it completely does not matter. Uh, it's not a chess game. It, it's not a, a, a checkers game. It's a chess game, the Electoral College. And so three quarters of the country, it's either a safe state one way or the other. And I think uh, instead of getting hung up about how I vote or you vote, it all depends on where you live. And uh, certainly at uh, votetrumpout.org, we have been reaching now millions of people on the left in the last few months saying, it is swing states where all this will be won or lost, and that's what we need to focus on. So you've said, you've said a lot in this, in, in this short time, Roman, and the time we have left, there are a couple of things I want to parse off from what you said and kind of explore them a little bit more depth with, with the time we have. I mean, one is that if you look at the power of the right in America, if you go back to the late 60s and early 70s, at the zenith in some ways, or, the, or maybe as, as, as the war was, was winding down, but people were still dying in Vietnam, that, this, that the, the movement was fairly strong, um, that you had this left inside the Democratic Party. Uh, and at that time, people like the man who became Justice Powell uh, began organizing the right and conservative movements to take power back. 
In 2010, you had Karl Rove, who created this red map organization to ensure that state legislatures would in fact become Republican strongholds in places like Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and other states. And they did it. And so while the left has always been associated with organizing, whether you look at it from the union movement or the SNCC workers in the South uh, or the Panthers inside of inner cities and other places, that, that the, the left, the, the people like Saul Linsky and, and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and others, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, were, were, were giants of how to organize people. But the right took those lessons and ran with them. The left did not over the last 30 years. So the right is highly organized and they're really moving to gain power. So the question is, in a larger sense, when you're looking at this election and looking at that reality and what they've done now because they have been able to seize power in certain ways, what, what's, your, so what's your response to especially younger activists and leftists about where to go? Well, I would say that uh, one of the places we need to go is to understand what the threat is and the magnitude of that threat how much it has burrowed into the power structure, the political economy, and the media systems of this country. I would really recommend, I know it's a lot to ask, that people on the left uh, take a little time and watch Fox News. I think a <laughs> lot, understandably, couldn't stand to do it, so don't do it. And do not understand how crazy, how sinister, how racist, and how repressive and anti-democratic, lowercase d, the right wing is in this country. And uh, to watch that and understand that is to see how far along they are. And to get out of our bubbles is essential because a lot of people are taken in with that messaging. So we need to broaden and deepen our own messaging. And as you mentioned, Mark, our capacity to organize, not only around elections, but 24-7, 365. That's the way the right wing did, did it. Uh, Pat Robertson was encouraging people, the, the right-wing evangelist Pat Robertson, 30 years ago was encouraging people to run for the school board and also build community institutions. And you don't have to get really uh, sociological and bowling alone and all of that to recognize that our capacity to organize in communities and have infrastructure and groups and uh, solidarity feelings day to day all that has been severely eroded, partly because of the decline of the, the labor movement and, and erosion of union power in the workforce. So we have to rebuild, you know, it's at many levels. It's, it's cultural, it's electoral, it's day-to-day -day interactions, it's building institutions like The Real News, I might add, where people need to support and put our money and time and energy uh, where our hopes are. It isn't by giving money to NPR and PBS, it's, this is an unsolicited plug. It's giving money to the real <laughs> news. You. And it's supporting the dozens and hundreds of progressive websites and also reaching out to friends, neighbors, coworkers, people we don't know, because in the long run, it all pays off. And uh, one of, the, you know, I used to say, and others used to say decades ago, it doesn't matter who's sitting in the White House, it matters who's sitting in. And that was completely wrong. It's not an either or. We've got to be dialectical about it. Yes, we need to be sitting in. We also need people in power who are not a brick wall like Trump, but people like Biden who are corporate shills who we can move. Roosevelt in 1932 when he was elected was not a progressive and social movements moved him to the left. We got the new deal. We've got to do that thing again. We can do it. We've got to be determined and organized to make it happen. So let me conclude here with, with what you just kind of left off with, which is where we might be going with all this. Um, you, 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 the, just strategically speaking in a very establishment sense, the Democrats need uh, suburban women voters who are mostly white to, to, uh, to come over, but they also need to have progressives and activists and, and uh, black folks and communities of color to be in solidarity at this moment to get rid of Trump. And that's a very broad coalition to try to build to make this happen. And one that probably is unwieldy in the long run. And then you have this interregnum we're about to face. And we don't know what's gonna happen there. I mean. The 25th Amendment, throwing it to the state legislatures, if Democrats don't win, they could lose there, they, the, 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 what could happen in the streets itself. And, and then what happens within the Democrats, what if Biden wins, and that battle internally. I mean, what we're, what we're about to see, we have no idea, this is almost uncharted territory. And, and, I, and A, is the left organized enough to do anything about it? And can they really respond? And, and, and so what is your take in your analysis 
of where what we may be what we may be facing in the coming months. Well, I think the left, especially online, is more organized perhaps than it's ever been. And we're facing, as you mentioned, a lot of unknowns. An electoral college margin is crucial. If Trump gets out of this election and he has just uh, uh, lost by a few electoral votes, we're probably screwed uh, because of the levers of power that you allude to. If, however, Trump loses the electoral college margin by a lot of votes, 50, 75, 100 or more, then he's really behind the eight ball. It'd be very difficult, I think, for him to leverage into the White House for another four years. Uh, the left has this uh, united front necessity against neo-fascism right now. As Cornel West says, this election is a choice between a neoliberal and a neo-fascist. And anybody on the left who says that neo-fascist is uh, the same as neoliberal, uh, I think is, is, is very sadly and historically mistaken. So we have this responsibility to be part of and power and help lead a united front against the neo-fascism of the forces of Donald Trump. And frankly, a lot of that united front should end with election night on November 3rd. And then we go back to the work that we've got to be doing day in and day out, which is building strong left progressive movements. <laughs> we include with, um... One of my oldest friends and comrades in life is my first wife, and Saida said she wrote to me saying um, that I would rather fight a neoliberal ol oligarchy than a neo-fascist military. <laughs> yes, well, that, that's well said. And in the current context, does the left want to organize against the brick wall of another four years of Donald Trump, or do we want to organize against a neoliberal uh, named Joe Biden, who we've already shown we can move, and if we really organize, we can move a whole lot more? Well, Norman Solomon, it's always a pleasure to talk with you, and I look forward to many more conversations as the election approaches and post-election. We see where we build this and where it goes, and I want to thank you so much once again for joining us here on The Real News. It's always a pleasure and enlightening to talk to you. Appreciate oh, hey, a pleasure for me. Thanks, Mark. Always. And for Erica Blount, producer Erica Blount, I'm Mark Steiner. Thank you all for joining us here on The Real News. Stay tuned in November 10th for Mark Steiner's show coming up, and stay tuned for the run-up and moving up the election our new production here to uh, look at this election, what's happening. We'll be live on election night as well, so stay with us for that. So for Real News Network, I'm Mark Steiner. Take care and vote.